Hello, I'm Lydia Nicole, and this is Acting Smarter Now podcast. If you are an actor and you want to level up your game, you have come to the right place. Not only will you level up your game, but you will get a better life because you'll have great information to help you out. Today, my first question for my guest is, what is the difference between American Latinos and Latinos internationally in the business? Well, the difference is that uh, Latinos here in the U.S. are Americans. We are Americans. We are, you know, infused with the American culture, uh, combined with some of our Latin background, depending on which generation you are, depending on whether you're a recent immigrant, whether you've been here for generations. But ultimately, uh, I think there's less of an identity issue and we become Americans. We speak English. Uh, some of us are bilingual. Uh, you know, so it, there's a sensitivity. Uh, we relate to different things. You know, just by the only, you can check out the, the difference by watching Channel 34, you know, or any of the Spanish language stations. There you'll notice uh, the difference. It's more profound uh, because culturally there's artists that we love here in the United States that, are unknown to us in you know Latin America, and there's some that uh, we know of and that we enjoy, uh, you know, universally. So it, it it all depends, but there is basically it's how you were brought up, and uh, basically uh, your background, what uh, you know, what the background, what your background is. Like I said before, uh, are you first generation, second generation, or have your family's been here for generations? Every Latin country has their differences too. Mexico is different from Chile or Peru. So they're, they're each uh, Latin American country has their differences, you know, within themselves as well. So, and you can see that sometimes here in the, in the United States as well. And sometimes uh, Hollywood treats the uh, international Latino more respectful than they do American Latinos, as far as acting goes. You know, sometimes they're looking for that special uh, Latin person. And so they overlook American Latinos to go for somebody in Spain or somebody from Mexico or somebody from Colombia. They they find that exotic, for them, it's exotic. No, I don't think so. I think it's more business. If you have a, an actor or an actress from Spain that is well-known or Mexico, and you put them in an American film, your film is gonna be more marketable internationally, as opposed to uh, an actor who may be just as qualified and just as good, but he's only known in the United States. So in terms of motion picture financing and marketing, uh, many films and deals are put together because you can have an international actor in the role that will hopefully increase the marketability of your film in the overseas market, which is today almost as important, if not more important than the domestic uh, film market. And that is why I have you here today. My guest today is the amazing Luis Reyes, who is not only a publicist, an author, but a director. And so Luis has got so much history, so much knowledge and so much information on Hollywood. I can't wait to get started. I couldn't sleep last night thinking of all the questions I wanted to ask you. So as we start, I want to know um, what what was it that you wanted to be when you were growing up? Did you always know that you wanted to be in show business? For the most part, yes, because I'm a child of the, you know, I'm a baby boomer. So I grew up with the early days of television. I grew up in the time when you had neighborhood movie houses that you could go to. So between television and the neighborhood movie houses, it was uh, a bit of an escape from, you know, the, you know, the work a day, you know, uh, living existence in, uh, in Spanish Harlem, Upper West Side of New York, where I grew up, you know, it was a working class area that was a mixed area of Puerto Ricans, uh, African Americans, uh, Irish Americans, uh, Jewish, you know, so it was a real melting pot in, in that way. So, uh, you know, and then, you know, I spoke Spanish at home with my parents, you know, because they spoke Spanish, a little bit of English that they learned, but 
uh, I spoke Spanish at home and then out in the street with your buddies and in school, you spoke English, you know. What did you have an idea specifically what you wanted to do in the film business when you were growing up? No, I guess acting, I guess, because that's what I saw on, on television. I didn't really know all the other things that were involved in the film industry until much later in high school when I uh, was able to, you know, read books on filmmaking. Uh, I used to stay up late and watch Johnny Carson and they'd have all of these filmmakers uh, come on and talk about uh, making their films, uh, Dick Cavett. Uh, so that kind of opened up the doors uh, to, you know, a wider appreciation and knowing what it takes to make a film. Because when you're, when you don't know, you just enjoy the movie for what it is, you know, okay? So you don't know the technical aspects of bringing a film to life or how they change things around. Or I remember the first time I came to California, uh, I went and I sneaked onto the uh, 20th Century Fox Ranch out in Malibu. And there was a giant uh, oriental temple. And I looked on the back of it and it said the sand pebbles. Wow. <laughs> and I'm going, wait a second. I thought the sand pebbles was a film starring Steve McQueen, directed by Robert Wise, was filmed in, in Southeast Asia. I think of Taiwan, I think it was. So what's this temple doing here? And I said, you know, it's not the Kung Fu Temple that I watch on TV. That's Warner Brothers. It couldn't be 20th Century Fox. Anyway, um, I watched the film again. And I realized that all of the scenes in the temple were shot at night. And the scenes, because I said, but wait a second. In the movie, they're walking up to the temple. And you see the whole bay of Taipei right behind them. Well, I didn't realize the movie Magic is that yes, those scenes of them going up to the temple were shot in Taipei, but when they actually enter the temple, that was here in Malibu, okay? Wow. Okay, so you have to look at the film closely, but you can tell, and then they shot, most of those scenes were shot at night once they get into the temple, so you can't really tell where they are, you know? So, I mean, those are some of the movie magic and tricks that, you know, when you're watching a movie, you don't, realize the the technical aspects of, of filmmaking or when i went to paramount at that time they still had the western street from bonanza mm -hmm. and i walked into the set of the of course i'm a cowboy i want you know i wanted to walk into the saloon in the bar <laughs> you know so i see the virginia city street and i see oh saloon so i walk into the saloon but there's nothing there once you walk in there's nothing there right and then i realized that the actual interior of the saloon was on a sound stage. So all they did was the scenes where they actually walk in, those were shot on the street. But once they walk in, that is done on a sound stage. Right. So how old were you when you first got to LA? Uh probably about 21 or 22. Okay, like so you came to LA from uh, uh you so so you went from New York to Stockton to go to school and then you came to Los Angeles? Correct, but I would oh. I went to school at University of Pacific in Stockton, correct? But then I, I would come down here to L.A. and work. Oh, I, I stayed with a friend of mine and I worked uh, any job I could get. Uh, and then on my time off, I would, you know, wander through the studios if I could get in. So it, at that time, there was things were pretty lax. There was, you know, no crazies or people like that. So literally you could walk if you look right. You could walk into the studio and you know walk through the employee entrance and you know yes as oh long he must as you be an actor respectful. going for an audition yeah, or something if you, if you knew what you were doing you could just walk in like you owned the place and nobody bothered you right they probably yeah. thought you're going in for an audition or yes. something so you know uh, and if you were dressed you know correctly or whatever you know you, you yes. like you said yes. you know yes. attitude is everything everything you know wow so it was so, easy so when so when you got to Los Angeles and you started working uh, when did you connect with nosotros. Yeah. Because that was a big... Um, oh, immediately. Certain... Oh, okay. Oh, because I had heard about Nosotros, you know, living in New York growing up as a kid. Uh, so as soon as I got here, I went to the organization, I called the organization, and they said, oh, we're having a monthly meeting next month, you know, you can come. And I wanted to find out, and that's where I got to meet Ricardo Montalban. And I got to see a lot of the 
actors and actresses that I used to see on television. For those who don't know what Nosotros is, Nosotros was and is an organization for Latino actors and others in the industry and that promote um, work for actors, for Latinos. And they were huge in the 70s and 80s. They really made a difference in Hollywood as far as making sure that they were hiring Latinos, they were including them in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. So go ahead. I didn't want to, I, I just wanted- yeah, And it was also an advocacy know. group for change, for a change in the image of Latinos on screen and on television. I mean, one of the first things they did was get rid of the uh, Frito Bandito uh, cartoon image that was used for to sell uh, Frito Lay chips. So, uh, and it was a very damaging portrayal, especially since uh, the chips, the commercials were geared towards kids, and the portrayal was of a bandito, but your stereotypical bandito with the bandoliers, the hat, the mustache, and so it was a kind of a derogatory. It was a derogatory image uh, of, of Latinos, particularly Mexicans. Uh, as um, Ricardo Montalban said, why did he have to be the Frito Bandito? Why couldn't he have been the Frito Amigo and given the chips away instead of stealing the chips? That was the whole uh, point of the commercial, that the chips were so good that the guy was stealing them. Mm -hmm. So that was the first big push that uh, Nosotros did to change the image, and they, were, and they canceled the commercial after a certain point and the character. How did how did Nosotros influence you uh, regarding what you wanted to do in the business? Because now you're now you're in the business as far as being um, being able to ex uh, get a hold of people one on one. You you're right there. You're in the room with all these Latino actors, all these Latino influencers. Um, what what did it do for you? How did it um, how did it change your perception? of what you wanted to do in the industry? Well, it didn't change my perception. It just gave me a, a, a greater understanding. Um, influence in the long run is the fact is that I got to meet a lot of the actors and people that I saw on the screen. And I noticed that for a lot of them, not all, but for a lot of them, it was just a job. Like you and I go to the office to work or to the factory. They went to the dream factory. But when I would ask them about some of their work, they say, why are you interested in my work? You know, they saw it as a job. You know, they didn't see it as influencing anybody or anything. And uh, there was no DVD or video. So once you did the, the job, that was it. It was a way of, you know, feeding your family. And they did a good job. They were good actors. They did, you know, wonderful work. But to them, it was just a job. They didn't see it. Very few expressed higher artistic aspirations. There so, were a, a few people that had higher artistic aspirations, obviously, but most people saw it as a job. So, so they were kind of surprised that someone was asking them about shows they did or who they worked with or that kind of thing. You So that informed you to start to interview a lot of these uh, Correct. performers. Correct. Start interviewing them and start writing down their stories because I did notice that there were no books there were even when I went to the Academy Library, there was no information on Latino actors. There were no files on Latino actors, uh, Amer uh, actors from Hollywood, you know, Latinos. Uh, so very few. So I noticed nobody was documenting these stories. And amongst themselves, you know, at the Nosotros meetings, when they would see each other, these talented artists would talk about their experiences on set, how they did things amongst themselves, you know. But nobody was writing these things down or, you know, or, or, you know, so, or a lot of them didn't even have photos. Oh, I worked with John Wayne. I worked with, you know, but they didn't have stills. You know, they didn't realize that you can go to the studio and get the books. You know, in those days, they would have photo of a still photographer that would shoot every scene in the movie. And a few people didn't realize that they could go afterwards and get copies of photos that they may be in. Wow. You know, so simple things like that, you know, you know, there was no video, there was no cell phone cameras, none of that in those days. And they had union rules that sometimes prohibited anybody from bringing any camera to the set, you know, so um, there was very little documentation. So, so I, that's I why wanna... I started to write articles and started to uh, 
put down these stories so and collect the photos. Sometimes I would collect them for them. Sometimes they would have them. They would give me copies in order to start documenting this history because no one had documented our participation as part of this wonderful industry. So before you got into publicity, you were already on your way to writing your your stories. Where were you putting these articles in? Well, I wrote uh, some location articles for, at, for the Los Angeles Times. I wrote them for some uh, newspapers like Classic Images. And I also wrote for a Latino publication at the time that was called QVO Magazine, que hubo, you know, uh, Latin Heat. Uh, so I was starting to write articles about Latinos in the industry for many different uh, publications. So it's important for our audience to know that you have written five books, two, one of which is Viva uh, Hollywood, which you did for TMC, and the other one is Hispanics in Hollywood, which I love. I love both of those books. But Hispanics in Hollywood was the first book that I saw where Latinos were included, where we were celebrating Latinos, which I give you a lot of kudos for because, as you said, there isn't a lot written on our, our people. There isn't a lot. Um, you know, as a Latino in Hollywood over 40 years, I never saw a book on Latinos until I saw Hispanics in Hollywood. Correct. But to be fair, uh, and that was 28 years ago, believe it or not. Wow. It was 1995. Wow. Okay. But to be fair, <clears throat> there have been a number of books by uh, academia, particularly uh, Chicano, Mexican-American, uh, books on Latinos or Mexican-American or Chicano images and films. So there oh, have okay. been a number of books uh, academic-wise, but I don't write academia books, okay? I just write down what the people said, and I let you make your own judgments as to whether they're all stereotypes or not. I, I just basically wanted to write down the uh, the stories and, and mark them down that everybody worked, didn't matter. Uh, even if they people weren't that concerned about stereotypes, they were more concerned about, you know, feeding their families, particularly in 1930 during the Depression. If you watch a movie like Gunga Din, which was shot in Lone Pine, California, because uh, it resembles the Himalayan mountains of India and, you know, and what is now Pakistan. Anyway, all those Arabs running around and Indians running around in that movie are all Mexicanos. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and in those days, they would pay you $3 a day and a box lunch. And, you know, they had to fill in these villages with people. So if you're a Mexicano, hey, you want to be in the movie? Yeah. You know, I can take my kids? Yeah. So let's say there's six in your family. Yeah, $3 a day. You know, that's eight, three times six is what, 18. You know? That's beautiful. In the middle of the Depression, you know, you got food, you know, plus you got paid. That's excellent. There was an actor that played a bandido so often that he had his own bandido costume, you know? And in those days, if you brought your own costume, they would pay you more. Mm. Okay, so he didn't care whether he was playing a stereotype, you know? All he cared about was, you know, earning a living, I you know? So that was another, you know, reality that we had to deal with was the fact that you had, you had to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, as one lady said to me, it was a way for her. She said it was like storybooks, working on a film was like storybooks come to life. Wow. So for her, it was an escape. Plus, she would earn some money. Wow. You so know? let me ask you. OK, so you you were writing from an early age when you got to Hollywood. You saw the need. You started um, recording and you started jotting down as much as you could. In the middle of that, when did you get into uh, publicity? Oh, well, I got a chance. Well, everybody saw that I was college educated, whatever, you know, and I could talk and I guess I had a good personality. So someone suggested publicity. It was, they said it's a lot, it's a steady career. And there weren't, there were no Hispanic or African American publicists at that time. So, uh, I said, why not, you know? And basically publicity work 
was basically what I did in college in the sense of the training is the same. I, I got my degree in education and inter-American studies. So when you're a publicist, you know, you're, you're writing like a term paper, you know, because you have to write all the information about the movie, the actors, the director, where it was filmed, the interesting aspects of the production. You have to work with photographers to make sure you get the photographs that will be needed to sell the film. You, you know, you have to convince the actors to pose for these photos. You have to arrange for things. So it's sort of like a, a doing a curriculum as you would in a, as a teacher. So it had some of the skills that I basically knew from, you know, from college. Did you have a mentor during that period when you started doing publicity? Was there someone that you could watch to see, okay, this is how I do it? Or did you have to figure all of this out on your own? I basically figured it out on my own. Nobody, I started working in the publicity department for a while till somebody suggested I be a publicist. But I had done some of the duties that a publicist does, but in the office. So, you know, you target articles at that time for when the movie's coming out, or you target, a, if it's a female lead, you target women's magazines, uh, you know, so it, it and depends on the, the subject matter of the movie as well. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, no, I just, it was basically hands-on, you know, you learn hands-on. You learn as you go. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, but I, I had the basic skills. So that was, so that's why education is very important. You know, uh, I had the basic skills. It was just a matter of applying them to that particular, you know, uh, employment. But I had the basic skills. As you were collecting all these stories and pictures on all these Latinos, were you always thinking, I'm going to write a book? I'm going to put this book together? No. No. Uh, it just kind of organically happened. I, I, you know, just, you know, you accumulate articles, you accumulate posters, uh, photos, and then, you know, it kind of happened organically. And then I said, oh, you know, let me write a book. But, and then writing a book is one thing. Trying to get it published is something else. And at that time, no, again, nobody knew anything about the Latinos that worked in motion pictures in Hollywood. There were plenty of books on Latin American cinema, plenty of books on Mexican cinema, but nobody had done a book about the Latino participation in Hollywood. So I was not a professor. I was not a teacher. So first of all, nobody knew anything about the subject matter. They didn't know whether what I was writing was factual or not. They had nobody to vet the material because nobody had done any research on this. Uh, when I would tell people I'm doing a book on Latinos in Hollywood, they would say, oh, it must be a very small book. Ha, huh. okay, little did they know. Uh, so anyway, so I had to overcome all of those hurdles after writing the book in order to get it published. Uh, and finally, I found it, oh, I had to get an agent too. And uh, so finally had to find somebody that uh, would say yes, okay? And finally, I found uh, an agent who said yes, and she had some contacts. And we kind of repurposed the book because I had done a more linear history. Mm -hmm. And she thought it would be more sellable if I did an encyclopedic history. So I had to rework the material in order to fit that criteria. And with that criteria, we were able, she was able to sell the book and, and the rest is history, so to speak. In Viva Hollywood, which is another amazing book. They're both, I think every actor, every Latino in the business should have these two books. This should be required reading for you. You should own it. You should know about your culture. You should know the contributions that we've made in this uh, industry and how important we are in this industry, even though we're not always credited. Uh, one of the things that I discovered from reading uh, Viva Hollywood was the fact that there was a, um, a designer or a costumer named William Trave Travilla, who was instrumental in Marilyn Monroe's look. Correct. Yeah, Bill Travilla, uh, who was an Oscar-winning designer, okay? He won an Oscar for making the costumes for Errol Flynn, 
in the adventures of Don Juan. Okay. And he was able to uh, have a relationship, a professional relationship with Marilyn. Uh, and he helped to design her wardrobe for several of her films. Okay. And Got nominated for uh, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend for the, the costumes in that. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And, but he's best known as the designer of the little white dress uh, that she wore in the seven year itch, the one where uh, she's uh, standing over the subway grating where her dress kind of uh, flies up with the air. And, uh, and it's an iconic photograph of her. Not uh, only that, but, not only that, but Debbie Reynolds bought that dress and was able to sell it at auction for over $4 million. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that, it's, it's amazing. A Latino from East L.A. made no, that dress. No, it's not from East L.A. It wasn't from East I thought he no. was from... He's from Avalon. Oh, okay, okay. For some He's reason, from Avalon. From His family from, he was born in Avalon. Okay, which is okay. a little island off the coast of uh, California, off of Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's a resort island. Uh, it's a little island, it's Avalon. Oh, okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah. No, I I love that. How um uh, other than actors, because uh, and and we can talk about the actors after this, but I'm curious to know how many other um important Latinos. Uh, were influential behind the scenes, like makeup people, camera people. I know, I know, uh, DP John Alonzo was a, a very, very big in the business, and people don't really talk about it. Just as Desi Arnaz was huge in the the way we shoot three camera um, sitcoms. Correct. Not only that, but he and Lucy Lucy O'Ball had a studio that the Desi Lu studio, where they not only did. I love Lucy, but they also did Star Trek. They did, uh, I believe it was uh, the um, oh god, the uh, the movie that uh, Kevin uh, Kevin Costner did, The Untouchables. Untouchables. Yes, and and uh, uh, Andy Griffith show. Co they did correct Andy Griffith show. So other than those that I mentioned, the, those two uh, gentlemen that I mentioned, who else? really made a mark in Hollywood being Latino, but we don't really talk about them. Oh, well, there's so many. There's Alex Romero. Alex Romero was a choreographer at MGM. And he helped actually to choreograph uh, for Elvis Presley for the movie Jailhouse Rock. Uh, there's a sequence where uh, Elvis is dancing uh, and uh, Alex Romero helped him because he was at MGM and the studio wanted kind of like a Gene Kelly production number. And Alex Romero said, this ain't, that, that's not going to work for uh, Elvis, you know? So he basically said, Elvis, show me your moves. What do you do when you're on stage, when you're performing? And Elvis showed him, he says, hey, okay. Uh, Romero worked out a routine and came back about an hour later. And that became the classic jailhouse rock uh, musical number that Elvis does in the film. So Alex Romero is one of them. And he also did, speaking of uh, Debbie Reynolds, he also did the unsinkable Molly Brown. Uh, and he was very good friends with Debbie Reynolds. Okay, so he was an MGM choreographer. Uh, you have uh, Marcel Delgado, Mexican-American, who created, well, helped to create the models for the 1933 King Kong. Okay, even though Kong looks huge on screen, there were little models, okay, that were movable. And he, he was the one that actually molded the models. There's a giant hand that comes through the window and grabs Fay Ray in the movie, the 1933 version. And uh, Marcel Delgado uh, built that hand, that movable hand. Uh, the other person is an artist by the name of Mario Larinaga. Okay, also Mexican American. Uh, he did what they call matte paintings, the backgrounds. If you see King Kong, the jungle behind them is all painted in. Okay, it's what they call matte painting. Okay, if you watch Citizen Kane, Mario uh, Larinaga did the backgrounds. So when you see uh, Citizen Kane's uh, mansion, the reason it's so big and so expansive is the fact that. Uh, 
Mario Larinaga did the background paintings to make uh, Xanadu uh, so huge, okay? So, and he went on to do, uh, you know, quite an other films, but those are the, the two classics uh, that he did. So there are many, many, uh, you mentioned John Alonzo, cinematographer. Well, John Alonzo, uh, to, his best known film probably is Scarface, okay? But he the was original, nominated for, for an not Oscar. The, not the original. He did the Scarface with Brian De Palma. Correct. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. The Scar with Al Pacino. Yes. yes. But he also won an Oscar nomination for Best Cinematography for the film Chinatown with Jack Nicholson. So, I mean, those are his, I mean, he's, he worked on other films as well, but those are his best known films and the ones that he was most recognized for. So there's a, a lot of behind the scenes talents that are there that we don't always uh, recognize. And some wonderful directors there. and some wonderful directors um, it, who also did Broadway because you had Jose Quintero who did Broadway, Correct. who was huge in doing the classics. You also had um, Jose Ferrer who did, uh, who acted and he also, um, I believe he did some directing. Yeah, he directed several films. They weren't all that good, but but he did it. But he did it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It. I mean, he was he was kind of like the Lin Manuel Miranda of his day. I mean, he did theater. He did you know television. He did films. He you know he he was the toast of the town on Broadway. He did like three or four plays at the same time. Uh, he won a Tony as well for Cyrano de Bergerac, and he also won the Best Actor Oscar for the same role. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, in the, and that was in the 1950s. As with Jose Quintero, I think he only directed one film, uh, which I think was the a film with Vivian Lee and uh, Warren Beatty, The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone. So let's go to the actors, because um, uh, Latino actors have been involved in filmmaking from the beginning. Correct. Yeah, from the beginning. I mean, people don't realize that the reason that they came to Hollywood was uh, there were lots of reasons, you know, the main ones was to get away from the patents in New York. In other words, it was like a mafia that George Eastman said that if you're going to make a film, you had to use his cameras. OK, and you had to and you had to pay big, big bucks to use his cameras. So the filmmaker said, you know, forget this. And they went as far west as they could get away from New York, because if they found you using somebody else's camera, they'd come in and bust you up. OK. Uh, it's kind of like a mafia kind of thing, you know, organized crime. So they moved west where they couldn't be bothered. You know, in those days there was no internet, no. So when you went out to California, that was going real far away, you know. So that was one of the reasons. And the other reasons was the topography, that you had the ocean, you had everything close by for different looks. Plus the weather was good. You didn't have to, like the industry started back east in New York and in New Jersey, you know, you have to deal with wintertime. And in those days, cameras were very sensitive. Uh, so you had to have a lot of natural light. They didn't have lights like the way we do now. So all of those factors, plus perhaps one of the most important was there was, if you're going to build an industry, you need people. And Los Angeles had an available labor pool of uh, Mexican-American, you know, uh, Asian-American, uh, African-American, and, uh, you know, Irish, you know, Italian, a lot of ethnic groups. Uh, that were, uh, you know, available to work because you need people to build sets. You need, they did Westerns, so you need people who could ride horses, who could take care of animals, livestock, all of these things. So uh, Los Angeles, Hollywood provided all of that, okay? And so it was an ideal place uh, to start an industry, and they did, you know. So you had, um, so early on, in, during the silent films, was it Antonio Moreno? Antonio Moreno, correct who came here from Spain as a teenager. And uh, he started with uh, the Edison company and the Biograph company in New York. And uh, he made his way out to California and uh, he became a leading player. And he had a bit of an accent, but it was silent film, so it didn't matter. It was your look and your ability to portray, you know, different emotions uh, on screen. And so he, played uh, a leading man in in many, many films up until, uh, oh, and he transitioned from silence to sound. And his best known 
sound, he became a character actor uh, later in his career. And his best known films, he played the Mexican vaquero that leads John Wayne to Chief Scar in the classic film, The Searchers. And he's also the professor uh, who helps uh, the crew members find the creature from the Black Lagoon in the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Okay. So you had Antonio Moreno, you had Ramon Navarro, okay, who was uh, our first uh, LGBTQ, I guess, uh, film star. Um, and uh, he starred in probably the biggest hit and that helped establish MGM in the silent days as a major studio, uh, Ben-Hur. And then he was a romantic leading man. He played Latin lovers, but he also played uh, different kinds of ethnic uh, roles. So uh, then right after him, later, for a short time, came an actor by the name of Gilbert Rowland, who started as an extra player. And he was able to uh, transition into sound films because he came at the tail end of the silent films. And he was young and good looking. And he was able to transition into sound films and had a career well into the 80s as a supporting you know, actor in, in many, many films. Then you had uh, Myrtle Gonzalez, who was the first Latina action movie star. And she started in the sound, I mean, in the silent period. But her career was short lived because she died in 1917, 1918 oh, wow. due to the pandemic. Wow. She was only like 26, 27 years old. But she did a number of films where she was the lead. Uh, there was another actress. She was, I think, from Venezuela or Spain. And she was a very well known actress in San Francisco. And she started her own production company uh, in films that she starred in. And uh, again, she was in the silent period. And then uh, probably the best known are is uh, Dolores Del Rio, who came in the 1920s from she, Mexico. And she, uh, she had a distinguished career. She transitioned, she transitioned to talkies, yes? She transitioned to sound films, correct. And then she went on to work. Uh, things didn't, after a while, things didn't go right here in the United States for her. She, she shot up like a rocket, but then she was not able to continue in leading roles and roles that really utilized her talents. Uh, so she left the United States and went to Mexico and helped to establish the Mexican film industry. And she joined with uh, a director by the name of Emilio Fernandez in several films that uh, won awards internationally, you know, like Maria Candelaria. And her leading man was another uh, famous uh, Mexican actor by the name of Pedro Armendariz. And then in between that, you had another actress by the name of Lupe Velez, who came from Mexico. Who and... had a hot and heavy thing with um, Gary Cooper. I, I read of her. Yes. I read of her when I was in high school. Oh, uh, yeah. Autobiography, uh, not an autobiography, a biography that was done on Gary Cooper, because I love Gary Cooper. And I was like, what? There's a Latina? A lot. That was, she was the first one that I knew of uh, in Hollywood as a Latina. Oh, yeah. Latina. No, yeah. she was. She was a, a great talent. Unfortunately, we all know her now as the Mexican Spitfire, but she did a great and enormous range. She's very talented. Uh, she did silent films. She did musicals. Uh, she did comedy. She, she did drama. She was a very uh, capable uh, performer, uh, but she kind of got, uh, because of her volatile presence and her because uh, of her passion, her passion. <laughs> yeah, but it was she played it out in the media yeah, to the she... <laughs> And that kind of overshadowed, and especially when she became the character of the Mexican Spitfire, it kind of melded a bit of her personality with uh, a character. Uh, somewhat, I mean, it's not unusual. It's somewhat like the uh, Fran Drescher kind of has that uh, New York Bronx, you know, Jewish personality as the nanny or, or Sofia Vergara, you know, on Modern Family. So it's a kind of a character uh, thing. So uh, it's, that works. I mean, it, it, it still, still works today, you know. Uh, so, but it overshadowed uh, her work, you know, as an actress, you know, sort of like uh, or Cesar Romero. I mean, uh, he had a long career in, in motion pictures and musicals, dramas, adventure, not only in films, but on television. But he did a he did a parade 
where uh, later in his career, and when the kids saw him, they go, hey, there goes the Joker from Batman. Even the parents, you know, oh, that's the Joker from Batman. Even to this day, I show pictures of Cesar Romero and people go, oh, that's the Joker from Batman. Well, while I was interviewing uh, Cesar Romero, he said to me, you know, after all the work I've done, they just remember me from Batman, you know? And then he thought about it for a while and he said, you know what? I guess it's good to be remembered for something. <laughs> no. William Shatner. Okay, he's a classically trained Canadian actor. Shakespeare. Out of all the work he's done, what's the first thing that comes up? Star William Trek. Shatner is Captain Kirk on Star, Star Trek. Trek. You know, so certain roles become signature roles, you know, for people. The actor and the, the character melds, you know, perfectly. You just mentioned something um, with Lupe Velez. And I think... Um, as a publicist, I want to get your your take on it because sometimes you have these really powerful actors that are very passionate, um, and but it does get in the way uh, their their spirit or their their feistiness gets in the way of their work because they're known as a troublemaker or they're known as somebody who they're volatile. <clears throat> you use that word volatile, and they're seen in the business as volatile. So sometimes people don't want to work with them. What would you say to a young actor who is very fiery, very, very, um, uh, very talented, if not gifted, but they are very emotional and sometimes it gets in the way. How would you speak to them on being able to have a career and not let their passion or, or their uh, opinionated side get in the way of their work? I think that comes with maturity and experience. And you learn from your mistakes as well as from your successes. I mean, I think that's why you have managers. Uh, you have people that handle you. Uh, that's why you have contracts. So it doesn't matter whether you get volatile. That's what's on the what's on the contract. You can get volatile all you want, but if the contract says this and this and this and that, you have to do it. So I always say, I would say, stay true to your passion. Stay true to who you are, because. And, and you learn uh, through experience. I mean, Kirk Douglas was known to be a, a, a very controlling, very volatile personality, but he was, all of his films were successful. Most of them, he had a successful career. He fought for better scripts. He, his volatility some, was sometimes based on, he wanted to do the best work possible and he wanted to get the best work from those around him. So I say st stay true to your passion, stay true to yourself, because what works for one person doesn't work for the other. Depends on how successful you are, okay? If you are the star uh, and you're successful, nobody's gonna argue with you. You know, they're gonna go with what, what sells and what's the best. And sometimes you can be volatile and you can still come out with a great product, but. It doesn't, you know, the audience is not interested at the time or, you know, it, it doesn't work because you can put all the best elements in the film and sometimes it just doesn't work. You know, you, and sometimes out of chaos, you get a great film. So it, it's hard to say. So I would say, make sure your managers, because whatever happens, it's what's in the contract. That is what is what it is, is what's in the contract. So unless you're, uh, going to cause a, a major problem uh, that's going to cost them money and you're not delivering in terms of box office or in terms of ratings, whatever it is, or in terms of just your work, your performance. Okay. Uh, so no, just be true to yourself and have good people around you and, uh, you know, work for the best uh, product and the best you you can be, you know, that's really what it is. But you, you know, you again you, with maturity, you learn how to control your your temper, your your things. Hope, you know, but you have to be hope, true. We hope, we hope with maturity. Yeah, and if not, you know, hey, as long as you're on top, people put up with it. Yeah, but a lot of times uh, they may not put up with it. So you have to learn. Oh, how if you're to... a success, they will put up with it. Yeah, well, if you're not successful, 
yeah, they won't but, put up with it. Okay. Yeah, so, but I, I think I think sometimes uh, they sometimes it can it can hurt you and not help you. So you have to you you have to know when to burn the bridge, so to speak. You have to know when you have to use. Well, well yeah, you have, that's that comes with judgment. Yeah, that comes with experience, uh, and it comes. You learn. That's the great thing about going to school, about doing, uh, about training. You know, um, some people get put into positions very quickly and they don't know. So they have to learn on the job. And sometimes you make mistakes. Uh, when you work in theater, you know it takes time for the lighting person to light you so that you look good. So when you're in a movie, it's the same thing. So you don't, you're not going to, you want to get on with the scene. But you realize that, hey, the cinematographer is doing his job to, and the lighting technician is doing his job to make you look good, you know, and to and to light the scene the way it should be for as the director desires. If you have no knowledge of that, you're gonna say, "What's taking so long?" Okay, well, I want to get this over. With. I want to get it done, you know. And then you have so the experience teaches you. I mean, Frank Sinatra, great talent, but he was only good on his first and second take. That was it. You know, so actors that worked with him had to learn to come up to speed right off the bat because you couldn't do 10 takes with him, okay? And he's the star. So he's the one that controls the set. So even though it takes you as an actor, oh, man, it takes me 10, 10 takes to get me where I want to be. No, you got to do it on your first or second take because you're not going to get any more with Frank because he's the star, Okay. And he's best on his first and second take. When it's fresh, he comes across natural. It's good. So those are things you learn out of experience, okay? Um, Let me ask you about publicity. Uh, how did being a publicist, as you were growing and developing and really um, setting your roots as a, pub, uh, as a publicist, how did that um, inform your writing? Oh, because when you write... When you're doing publicity on a film, I think I mentioned it's like a term paper. At the end of the production, you have to write what is called production notes, production information. Right, but did you start learning how, because um, you said earlier you had to teach yourself a lot of this stuff. So as you were going, you how did you, did you learn to adapt or to uh, tweak your writing? You know, it's like, okay, I can write this better. I can, I can write this production note better. I can make this article better now because I, I have more information than I did when I first started. Correct, because I know the terminology. I know what goes on the set. I'm there every day. When you work as a publicist, you're on a, what you would call a unit publicist, U-N-I-T, unit publicist. You're on the set every day. You sit down with the actors and you interview them while you're on the, the movie to ask them, well, how, did, how does it feel being in Mexico doing this film? Uh, what is your character like? I mean, uh, Anthony Quinn taught me. He said, I'm not, I said, you're the villain. He says, I'm not the villain. You know, he says, as an actor, you know, I believe in what I'm doing just as much as the, the hero or the protagonist does. I have a point of view, okay? I have a history to who I am, okay? I said, oh, all right, I didn't know that. Okay, I just thought you're just a villain, but the villain has reasons why he's doing what he's doing or she's doing what she's doing. Okay, so to answer your question, you learn the terminology. You learn to write, okay, about the character that the actor is playing in that particular film. You get the point of view of the director. You talk to the director. You write why he wanted to make this particular film. Uh, what's his point of view on this film? What are the production aspects it was shot in mexico shot in the u.s is in the desert are you dealing with hot temperatures wind uh, i mean all of the things that go the production designer the behind the scenes people so in a funny way it was like writing the book you know in a very minuscule uh way because it's no way is it a book of production information but this production information is given to the press when the movie opens so that they know who the actors are what characters they're playing, uh, information about the movie, where it was shot, uh, the director, the production designer, the cinematographer. So in a way, it was uh, sort of preparing me to write, when I did write the book, 
already had an idea because when you write these notes, you have to convey the essence of the film in a very simple way, quick way, without giving away too much because you want the person to watch the movie and but have a little bit of an appreciation of what the movie is about. You want to tease what's them. Involved. You want to tease them. You want to entice them to come and watch the movie from your Correct. writing. Correct. Let me ask you, three iconic actors that spoke to you, that gave you information like Anthony Quinn did uh, about something that you didn't, it, it never came to your imagination. Like you never thought about it. You were like, oh, that's something that you, to this day, you still utilize. Because I'm sure with what Anthony Quinn told you about his character, that he didn't see the character as a villain, but as a person. And he was just doing what he had to do. Were there have there been any other iconic actors that you've worked with, like Ricardo Montalban or Eddie Olmos, who have given you information that you go, you know what, I, I get to use this now in my um publicity, in as far as an author and as a as a director. Well, Ricardo told me that television gave him wings as an actor because when he was at MGM he got kind of typecast into kind of a Latin lover kind of thing I mean he did do several other roles but he was kind of typecast and television gave him the opportunity to play a wide variety of characters believe it or not in one television show he played a man who was afraid of women <laughs> okay i mean so he said television gave him wings as an actor because it allowed him to expand his range and his talent uh so that was one oh raquel welch told me that she made more money from the poster of her in the little fur bikini uh from one million years bc than from the actual film. Wow. Okay, because she she was under, under contract to 20th Century Fox and she filmed that movie in England and in the Canary Islands. And that poster of her in the little fur bikini sold more than any other poster up to that time. Uh, actually, there weren't that many posters to begin with, so and she held the record for selling uh, the poster until uh, Farrah Fawcett in the 80s did her poster. That sold more. But other than that, but as a contract actress at Fox, she wasn't paid that much. So she made the money from that film because from the uh, poster. And that also helped to elevate her career as a sex symbol and as an actress. I worked with Selma with the Selma Hayek early in her career, actually on her first American film. Uh, that was uh, she was given the role in a movie called Mi Vida Loca about gang girls, and it was her first American film, and uh, it was done for her. The role was given to her. It's a small role, but it enabled her to join SAG, okay, the Screen Actors Guild, uh, because she was. Uh, a rising star in Mexico, but she didn't, when she came here, in order to work, as you well know, you have to be a member of SAG. So, uh, like Alison Anders, who was the director of Mi Vida Loca, uh, hired her, and with that, she was able to get her SAG card. Wow, she got Taft Hartley yeah. so she could join yeah. the union. Wow, that's that's amazing. What is it that you love about Hollywood? Well, because it's an escape. It's an escape from the everyday. It's very creative. I mean, it puts you in different worlds and different stories, different people. Uh, every day is exciting. It's different. It's very hard work. Uh, it's challenging. It's not easy, but that's that's what gets you going. And it's very creative and working. It's a collaborative process. You have to work with different people and very talented people in order to do what you need to do. And uh, so it's it's fun. It just gets your juices going. It's exciting. And you learn a lot about the arts, about humanity, about the world. Uh, you're lucky enough because of my 
bilingual abilities. Uh, I was able to work in Mexico uh, on 10 films because I not only could speak the language, but I also understood the culture. So I understood how to work in Mexico. So I worked on 10 American films, Hollywood films in Mexico. And one of the reasons that I was hired was the fact that I spoke Spanish. I was bilingual in English and I also understood how to get things done in Mexico and how to work with people in the press and kind of thing. What you, you said there are challenges. What, what are some of the challenges that uh, publicists deal with? Because we never think of publicists dealing with challenges. Well, they- you're, you're a problem solver. Well, it depends on what kind of different publish depends on different things. You're marketing a movie. Well, who's this movie for? What's the obvious audience for this movie? You have to figure it out. So, and then once you figure it out, then, okay, is it for young teens? Okay, so we go, what do young teens do? They read magazines, they're on the internet. Are there influences? Uh, do you have special screenings? Do you send them in? So you have to figure out who your audience is. Uh, so that's the challenge. And then is there a greater audience for this film? Uh, you know, uh, how do we tie in to different things? Uh, sometimes an actor or an actress has a problem in their career. Uh, how do you deal with that in the, in the press? Uh, how do you control that? Do you have the person speak to the press? Do you have prepared statements? You have to see if that, sometimes when you give a person lines, they're fine, but in real life, they don't, they can't talk. Uh, one of the advantages that I have is that I can talk. A lot of writers, they can write, but you put them in front of a TV screen or interview situation, they don't, they can't explain what they do. So as a, as a PR or publicist, you have to deal with maybe crisis in people's lives, or if they said something that was misunderstood, how do you uh, portray that or fix that situation as best as possible with, with the people and the public, that kind of thing. Uh, so there's cri- what they call crisis management for in, in PR situations. So you have to deal with that too. So it, it all depends. Uh, making that person, preparing that person for an interview, if they've never done interviews, okay, what is the purpose? If you're there to sell a movie, you don't want to go on, uh, you know, any of these talk shows and talk about everything else and you forget about the movie. You're there to sell a movie or, or an album or whatever. So you want to make sure that you get your message out and how do you do that without getting sidetracked or. So that is that of- something that you would, you would give the actors some questions to kind of familiarize themselves so that they would be able to articulate Correct. Absolutely. I mean, it's they, especially with actors or anybody, you have a script. Okay. I want to get one of the, well, one of the great things I learned again is when I was at Universal, uh, we had Jimmy Stewart, James Stewart, the actor from It's a Wonderful Life. Okay. He was doing publicity for a series of films he did with Alfred Hitchcock. And he went out on a publicity tour because they were re releasing these Alfred Hitchcock movies. And I saw the uh, newspaper clippings of his interviews. And for every interview that I saw, 98% of them, he said the same thing. He had his script down as to what to say, who to say it to, how to describe. He had, he had it, you know, and, every, and when you look at all the clippings, he said the same thing to everybody. It took a really... Uh, really seasoned journalist to be able to ask a different question and get a different answer from him. How important is, is that for the actor to have a few different questions so that it doesn't come off like rote, you know, they're saying the same thing, the same thing, but to have maybe three different answers for the same question. Oh, it's, it's important. Uh, It's important. And again, everybody, we interact, with individuals differently, okay? So I interact with you differently than I would interact with another interviewer, okay? But the basic idea is still the same, but you can get stuff out of me that another person would not get, okay? But I still have my script down, okay? So that's what, that's what happens. So it is important to have several answers, but basically, it's the same answer, but you maybe you worded differently because that person approached it differently. Okay. So, and their skill as an interviewer, uh, 
brought something else out that maybe you hadn't thought of, okay? But what I'm saying is that it's okay if the answers are wrote because when you're dealing with 15, let's say 50 interviews in a day. You're talking about a press junket. When you're yeah. yeah. In a, uh -huh. it's, it's quite, uh, you don't want to go too off the, the beaten path. So really, you, you have your set things to say. And depending on who you're dealing with, you might change it around a little bit or they approach it differently, you know, so, but you have your script down. And, oh, the point I was going to make, you have 15 different newspapers. You're going to read the newspaper in San Antonio. So the person in Los Angeles is not going to read the San Antonio paper. So even though it's the same answer, it's not going to be, you're not going to notice it. I noticed it because at what we do in publicity is when we send somebody out on a publicity tour, you get copies of their interviews, either the paper interview from the newspapers when we had a lot of those, or you get video copies of the interview they did for, let's say a TV interview or that kind of thing. So you, we watch them all to see and then, oh, okay. And then, How important is it for an actor, the, the um, production company will have their own publicist, but how important is it for an actor to have their own publicist or PR firm uh, behind them? It's very important because you have to push your own career when you're working. It depends on what level you are as an actor, but you need to push a production company is pushing the movie and the star. If you're not the star of the movie, they are not that interested in pushing you. Okay. So you have to push yourself. Okay. So that's, what's important. Uh, a publicist is working for you. So they are pushing you. And you have to make sure that if you're working with Tom Cruise and maybe your role isn't that big or not as, as big as Tom Cruise's is, the fact that you are in a movie with Tom Cruise is important. But what's even more important is that you make sure that you get your photo taken with the star. Because I cannot tell you how many times I've been able to place an article on an actor who maybe did not have a big, big role, but he got his picture with the star of the film, okay? And because he had that picture with the star of the film, a really good photo, uh, it, that article gets published. Particularly if you're, uh, if you're from New York or if you're any hometown uh, or high school newspaper, hey, this graduate just did a film with Tom Cruise or Harrison Ford. And here's this picture with, with Tom Cruise and Harrison Ford on set. They'll publish it. As opposed to saying, I did a movie and you don't have a photo. Well, it doesn't have the same credibility. So that a photo can make it or break it. So that's important. A lot of actors I know of, oh yeah, I worked on this movie. Do you have any photo? No. So there's anything no documentation. Else? Is there anything else besides a, a photo showing social proof? Is there anything else actors should have as part of their publicity packet? Yeah, a biography. A biography of tells your work of you know where you studied, uh, theater uh, performances, other films you've done, television, um, all of those things that are important. And you start with the most important thing first, your most recent thing first, and then you work your way down, OK? Uh, but yeah, a biography is very important, a bio that tells me who you are. That's very important. And how about, uh, how important is uh, a dem a reel that kind of shows clips of their work? Is that important uh, as part of their publicity packet? That helps, yeah, anything visual helps. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, if you've got a, a, a video reel, yeah, you know, I think it, it works more better for your, uh, for acting purposes, but uh, for, uh, yeah, anything that can show your work. The only problem is that uh, sometimes because of rights questions and you can't show some of those scenes, you know, on the, on the video reel, you know, unless it's a new, it's just something that you just did recently, you know, then you can, but then you have to get, if it's a radio state, you can use it to interest somebody but if they want to show, if you're doing, they want to show it on KABC, then they have to go through. Get the release. 
yeah. have to get released for yeah. a, a, a release for because it. there's rights questions and there's residuals questions. Oh, about. okay, that's good to know. Um, I want to know how, when was it? Because because you just finished um, directing Pepe Senna's documentary, Life Is Art. Did you always, in the back of your mind, think I'd like to direct? Well, I'd like to direct a documentary because with all the stuff that you have researched and garnered for your books, that to me sounds like a documentary. It's stuff that could be done. But was there a moment where you thought, you know what, I, I know a lot about how to do a film. I've been on so many sets. I've worked with so many people. I, I think I, I could do a really good job at this. Yeah. I mean, the I've I've had a feeling for it for a long time. And it's just a, whether the opportunity presents itself. And life takes you in different directions. Uh, so the opportunity presented itself. I know Pepe's career. Uh, we had the opportunity of doing a documentary on someone's life while the person's still alive. So it was a documentary in his own words, as opposed to somebody being dead and you trying to figure out <laughs> you know, their life or what it meant or whatever, you're getting it from the horse's mouth. Okay. So that was unique in and of itself because usually you don't have uh, documentaries where that actual person is actually telling his story. So that was unique. And also um, Pepe is a very positive, uplifting personality in person. So I thought that was different because he's not a drug addict, a reformed drug addict. Uh, he hasn't been to jail. Uh, his parents are not recent immigrants. Okay. His family's a good family. He's been here for generations. So he kind of defies, are, not that there's are you anything trying wrong. To say, are you trying to say he's not the norm in Hollywood? Is that what you're trying to say? Louis? Well, in terms of the, <laughs> of the stereotypes and the images, yes. And even we fall prey to that too. And there's nothing wrong, you know, Oh, all Mexicans are from East LA. No, you know, Pepe's from Texas, Corpus. So he kind of dispels many of the stereotypes. Okay, his own life, not intentionally, it's just that's his life, okay? Not that there's anything wrong from of being from East LA or that you're a reformed drug addict or prisoner or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that, but this was a positive uplifting tale, story of a man who went after his dream, his passion, and uh, succeeded, okay? And he branched uh, out not only acting, but theater, uh, film, uh, art, as for art's sake, physical art. Um, so, and his life, life itself, uh, as that became his life and still is, and he's still working. So uh, that interested me, plus I, you know, so, and it became a process of discovery as you go through the material and you shape the material, you do interviews with people, they give you insights. Oh, I didn't think about that. You know, oh, you know, he played in a lot of Westerns. So he was able to say, he enjoyed playing cowboys and Indians or, co you know, cowboys and Mexicans, as he would say. But uh, he also told us about, you know, some of the true history of the Mexican vaquero and the history of the American cowboy, how it came about from the Mexican vaquero. Okay, so out of that, and then his, his story is set against uh, the Chicano movement and the civil rights movement and the images of Latinos in film uh, and the choices that he made. So it, it all came through, you know, in the process of discovery of putting all those pieces together and making it interesting for an audience, because that's another thing. Uh, some Everybody has an interesting life, but to sit down for an hour, you got to give people something that's going to you know, at least hold their interest for an hour, you know? So that also is, a, especially in our age where everybody wants everything in five minutes, you know? So, yeah. So, yeah. So I thought I could do it. And in a way, you're right. It is a way of um, putting a book together, but it's actually a book in a visual form, if you want a visual and audio form. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I, I mean, I can't wait to see it. Um, you, you brought up stereotypes. Pepe is not a stereotype, but in Hollywood, especially when you got here, because I, I think I came just a little after you, but when you got here, 
uh, Latinos were always portrayed as stereotypes. How has it changed from when you got here in the 70s to now, as far as how Latinos are portrayed on, on film and in television? Well, in film, we're still, the portrayals are getting better. The characters are more nuanced, uh, but we're still lagging behind in film. Um, recently, we had Flaming Hot, uh, that was directed by Ava Longoria. So we're starting to tell and formulate, you know, more nuanced, more complete characters and stories from our experience as Americans here in the United States. Um, but we're lagging behind in comparison to other ethnicities or ethnic groups. I mean, uh, we don't have uh, big box office names. Um, interesting enough, women have seemed to have fared better in Hollywood as far as feature films. I mean, we have, I mean, the biggest Latina star really uh, that can get projects green light uh, is really Jennifer Lopez. Okay, of a Latina from here, okay. Uh, Selma Hayek, Penelope Cruz, uh, you know, the uh, Zoe Saldana, even though she's been in some of the biggest movies ever made, She's always in makeup, so she does, doesn't have quite the recognition factor than the other girls or the other women have. So uh, interesting enough, women seem to have done better, at least as far as feature films go. Um, we don't have a Latino uh, rock, Dwayne Johnson, action star. That might be changing if he gets the right roles. The young man, uh, Zolo Madrideño from the Blue Beetle. If he gets the right roles, he could be a big, big star. He has the charisma and the look and he's young. But we don't have any real big male stars that draw audiences. I mean, uh, Edward James almost is great, but he's an old man. So is Andy Garcia. I mean, there are veteran stars. And now, you know, talking about our book, I mean, I told Eddie the other day when we were talking, I said, we're, you know, including me, we're the old guys to the kids because the kids don't know Ricardo Montalban at all. If they know him at all, it's from Spy Kids. Oh, that's the grandfather in the wheelchair in Spy Kids. But they don't know Anthony Quinn, Dolores, Kathy Huda. They don't know any of those uh, people. So, But they do know Edward James Olmos. They do know Andy Garcia. But we're old guys to these kids. We don't have up-and-coming young stars. Again, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. the only one that could, again, women. Well, you got Jenny yeah. Orte Ortega. Well, yeah, exactly. That's out. again, women. Yeah. For some reason, women seem to do better. Okay, that that could be a whole exploration in itself, you know, uh, discussion. But uh, other well, we than got, that, we got some. We have some good young men who are coming through. They might not have broken all the way, but you got Miguel uh, 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 Pena. Who? Uh, is it Miguel Pena? Um, uh... No, see, no. Let me let me clarify this. Okay, we. Michael Pena is almost, Michael almost Pena. 50 years old. Oh. <laughs> okay. He's like, been around 20 he years. Looks, he looks he great. Don't realize it. He looks great. He's no, got it. Of course. A, but what I'm saying great. is, we have, <laughs> excuse me, let me be clear. We have many talented actors and actresses. We have the talent. We just have not been able to create the, either through Hollywood or through our own opportunities that have launched major stars that are box office stars. There's no one bigger and recognizable in our community than Edward James Olmos or Andy Garcia, okay? And Jimmy Smith. And Jimmy Smith, but they don't have the power to green light. People don't go to movies to see them, to green light a picture, okay? Like they go see Tom Cruise, okay? And movies now are dominated by young people. They always have been. Okay, they want to see a representation of themselves or actors they can relate to or actresses. Okay, so as far as feature films, we're still, we don't have that box office star, except for, like I said, Jennifer Lopez. And on the male side, we don't have a, a, a Latino rock or a Latino leading, young leading man. That's what I'm saying, Cholo Madrudeño from Blue Beetle, if he gets the right follow-up roles, could be our Tom Cruise, okay, in that sense, where he's the romantic leading man or, action or whatever the case may be. Uh, as far as directors, American directors, 
the biggest name is Robert Rodriguez. Okay. He has someone who has given countless opportunities to so many people and created nuanced American Latino characters. Okay. I mean, the Spy Kids family. Okay. They like, they just happen to be a, fa they're a family of spies that just happen to be Latino. Okay. He, gave, he, he brought uh, Salma Hayek. I mean, when the studios didn't want to hire her for the role in Desperado, he insisted on her. He gave Antonio Banderas the opportunity to be an action star, okay, which led for him to be Zorro, okay, through Desperado. I mean, he made Danny Trejo, Machete, okay. I mean, I can go on and on. Cheech Marin has worked with him, even though Cheech has had his own career. But so Robert Rodriguez, as far as uh, filmmakers of Latino origin who are American, born here, he is the biggest and consistently the moneymaker, okay? All of his films make money, and he does action-adventure movies for the most part, and all of his films do well at the box office. And that end result, that's what counts in Hollywood. It's, making, it's a business, okay? It's an art form, but it's also a business, so it's about making money. How did your relationship with TCM start? Well, they had, I had attended their film festival that goes on every year here in Hollywood, and... Uh, they had heard about my book, uh, Hispanics in Hollywood, but I had, and my articles, and also I've done several other books. Uh, my best-selling book has been the Hawaii movie and TV book, which is about all the movies that were shot in Hawaii and television shows. And uh, that's everything from Magnum P.I. to Hawaii Five-0 to classics like From Here to Eternity. Um, so... They, had, they knew that I could write different books. I, before then, I had done a book called Made in Mexico, which was about all the Hollywood movies that were shot in Mexico. People don't realize there were over 200 movies, American movies, shot in Mexico, including the best known probably is Titanic. Okay, that was shot in Baja, California at a studio that was especially built in Rosarito uh, to uh, make the film, okay? So... Uh, they had called and they asked me if I would be interested in writing this book and it would not be a comprehensive book like the first book, Hispanics in Hollywood. It would highlight the achievements of Latinos, both in front of the camera and behind the camera uh, in Hollywood classic movies. So as I said in the, uh, you know, in the beginning introduction to the book, uh, it's not a comprehensive book. So there may be people there that are, some of your favorites that are not included, but it highlighted uh, the achievements of Latinos, uh, particularly in, in classic Hollywood movies. So uh, they contacted me and uh, they liked what I had done in the past and they liked my proposal, they asked for a proposal. I gave them one uh, and they liked that and I'm easy to work with, uh, you know, so, and I'm open to suggestions and, uh, it worked out, you know. So not only did you do the book, Viva Hollywood with them, but they also have you come on during Hispanic Heritage Month to feature some films. Correct. Yeah. Uh, well, they wanted someone who was an authority on Latinos and films. And I guess they like what they what I did in the book. And they asked me to come on. And I guess I interacted well and gave, and gave information. And I guess the audiences must be happy with it. Otherwise, uh, they would have taken me off. Uh, uh, <laughs> didn't ask, and, but they asked me back, and I'm back again this year. I'm doing a tribute uh, to the first Latino and only Latino Oscar winner in the Best Actor uh, category, uh, which is uh, Jose Ferrer. So we're going to be talking about his life and career and show three of his films uh, for Hispanic Heritage Month. Oh, that's awesome. What would you like your legacy to be? Because you have really done so much in the business. Uh, just the fact that you put these books together um, really put you up there, like somebody to who really made an impact. What would you like your legacy to be? Well, I don't know if I've made an impact. Yes, you <laughs> have. Uh, well, you have because you you have brought information to the forefront that we didn't have access to, readily have access to. So you you know you it's quiet as it's kept, Luis. You have you've done a really excellent job bringing us to the forefront. Correct. And it's not about the forefront. 
actually. It's about more a more complete story because everybody contributed to this wonderful industry called Hollywood. Uh, again, I did not realize that many different ethnic groups contributed to what we call Hollywood. Uh, I didn't realize that Billy Wilder, who uh, wrote quite possibly the best American film comedies, wrote and directed uh, Some Like It Hot and many other classic films, he was a German emigre. He emigrated here from Germany and he mastered the English language. Okay. Uh, there was an actor by the name of Victor Mature. He kind of looked Latino, but I couldn't figure out what he was. I got to meet his daughter and she says, well, his real name was Maturi. And they gave him the name Victor Mature, but he's Italian, American. So, I mean, uh, Anna Mae Wong. I mean, I show her with Anthony Quinn in the book. We didn't work in a vacuum. Latinos worked with everybody in the industry. Uh, and the industry is made up of so many different people. And I think that's what I wanted to stress, that it's part of the whole story of Hollywood. I'm not saying that it's better or worse or whatever. Uh, it's part of the whole story of what is Hollywood. Something that really stood out to me in, in going through the two books, and that was the diversity that there's always been diversity in Hollywood, even though we don't talk about it. There has always been diversity from the beginning. Uh, they may not be brought to the forefront, but there's always been diversity. You've always had all these uh, ethnic groups coming together to make film, to make television, to make theater, that it, it hasn't just been one, one particular race that has done it, but it, it, it has been a, uh, a salad bowl of people uh, of different ethnic groups coming together. And that, that really stood out to me, especially during this time when we're fighting for diversity and they're trying to take away affirmative action and, and how it's impacting, but that we've always been included um, or we've always put ourselves in there, even though we're not highlighted. Correct. I mean, there's been, you know, we've been misrepresented, underrepresented at times. Okay. Um, we've been typecast and stereotyped, um, but we've been there. Okay, whatever roles were there, we were there, we worked. Uh, sometimes with, you know, we would work and play nuanced characters. And sometimes there were stereotypes, but we brought whatever we could to the role and, and that was it. Uh, but we've been there and now we're taking control of our images and our representation. We're being more creative, being included in the creative process. We're telling stories from our particular perspective. Uh, there's a sense of authenticity there that maybe wasn't there before. Uh, so things are changing because now we are the storytellers uh, and we're able to exercise that within this industry. And I think it's starting to show more. Uh, the success of the Blue Beetle uh, has really helped along with uh, the uh, Flaming Hot. Uh, not only it's written by Latinos, but directed by Latinos. Uh, we have the success of the Mexican filmmakers have also opened up opportunities, even though people from Latin America, as we had said previously, they're not Americans. So they have a, a different sensibility as to certain things that uh, we do, okay, those who are grown up and raised here in the United States. Uh, so I think it, it, uh, it's a good time, especially on television. Because of streaming, there are more Latinos working than ever before on television, on streaming, in Latino roles, and in non-Latino roles. And we're better represented not only as a people, uh, as part of the U.S. experience, but also in just playing any character. I mean, one of the best things is, uh, and it doesn't get enough praise, is uh, Magnum P.I. with Jay Hernandez, okay? And the Lincoln uh, Lawyer. He's just, don't, mm -hmm. don't forget, and don't forget the Lincoln Lawyer. Those are two. Yeah, and the Lincoln Lawyer is also, but uh, Jay Hernandez is, uh, he's just a brown guy playing Magnum. They don't try to make him Latino. 
They don't try to make him Hawaiian. He's just an actor playing a role. And I think that is really an ideal situation. You know, he has a relationship with Higgins, with the girl that plays Higgins, Bradita Weeks. Uh, there, he has African American buddy, a white buddy. I mean, he uh, he interacts with everybody in a multicultural atmosphere as part of the American experience in Hawaii. And I think uh, that is really important. We don't see enough of that. Okay, uh, and I think that symbolizes, you know, where we want to be. At least some of us as as actors and performers and artists, where you don't mind playing just Latino roles if the characters are well written uh, and nuanced and great stories, no problem. But you, as an actor, you also want to expand your range. You want to do different things, and you want to play all different types of characters. And I think uh, that is more evident in streaming and on television than it is in, in feature films. I mean, I could. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but we could go on and on and on talking about, I can give you a list of all the Latinos. Yeah, no, that's uh, a good, this is, this is good. Another time we'll, we'll, we'll just talk about that. Cause that's a, that's a show in itself. Correct. Um, so I want to come back to the question. What is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Uh, I don't like the question because it kind of seems, <laughs> did you look at my x-rays recently? <laughs> no, like, I, yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> Do you know I, something I don't? <laughs> no, I don't. But I, I think it's important for us to have vision for the future. Like what, you know, what we're well, my future. Towards. Well, my future, uh, I'm, uh, I'm more, como decía mi mamá, estoy más para acá que para allá. You know, so uh, I'm more going in the opposite direction, you know, because time is limited on my end. Uh, I just say that, you know, I was creative and I was uh, able to put down the document, the, the history and the talents of, you know, of American Latinos in, in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, I was hopefully a good father, good husband, uh, you know, good friend to people, I guess, you know, uh, that's it, you know. That's a lot. That's yeah. that's a lot. I think okay. If, 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 you, if I'm only good for one or two checking off, then I guess we're good. Uh, <laughs> I think I think you've checked everything off. That is okay. very good. Well, if you are an actor and you want to do well in this business, I have an online course called Acting Smarter Now that I suggest you take. It will help you. It will give you information about the business that you probably didn't think about. It will make you a better actor business-wise. A lot of times as actors, we focus on our craft, but we do not know business and it gets us in trouble. So if you go to actingsmarternow.com, you can get all the information you need. Until next time, thanks for joining us.